It is a good morning. Um, when we're listening to that song, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but you know where it says, he's never failed me yet. Would you agree with that? That God's never failed you yet? Amen. There was one time that they changed that piece of the chorus up and it said, you've never failed. And that really jumped out at me this morning because sometimes we associate God not failing us with what we want. But to say God has never failed me means that sometimes what I wanted got changed for what was best for me. Because sometimes God needs to say no to something that seems good so that he'll make room for something that's God. So he's never failed, period. Nor will he ever. And so to be a child of God means that that's pretty awesome news. So every morning when we wake up should be a celebration like we had last week, which is when we celebrate the resurrected Jesus. Because every morning when our feet hit the ground, that's what we should walk in. The resurrected Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen. So when somebody asks you, if, how you doing? I'm all right. Now, I'm not saying you have to be, I mean, different personalities, different things. But... Because some people, it takes a couple cups of coffee to wake up. Not my wife. <laughs> it does me. Uh, not necessarily two. Two makes me a little jittery. Uh, but, you know, you have morning people and then some that aren't. The different thing is there is a joy that resounds in us that no matter what we're going through, we can stand on the fact that God has never failed me yet. He has changed my outlook on some things, changed my perspective, because he's never failed, period. And that's good news. So if you have your Bibles this morning, let's go to the book of... Okay, it's only taken 12 months to where we're getting on track with that. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 16. Book of Acts, chapter 16. <coughs> I, we're going to study, we're going to go through a lot of scripture today. Don't want you to get freaked out about that. I'm not going to tell you how many verses because you definitely get freaked out. But we're going to go through a lot of scripture. But the reason we're going through the scripture, if you were here with us last week, you remember that we started, West started us two weeks ago in this Macedonian call. Paul and Silas had this plan to loop back around to their, for the second mission trip to check on all the churches they planted the first time around. A man sent by in a vision to, by the Holy Spirit to Paul says, hey, if you don't mind, come to Macedonia. What we don't realize is that was quite a trek. I mean, because this is, Macedonia is what we know Europe, okay? So now we're in the book of Acts. Remember when Jesus said, you'll receive power to be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world? We've seen that actually play out in the book of Acts, exactly like Jesus said it. They stayed in Jerusalem the first seven chapters. Then they went to where? Judea, Samaria, and now we're seeing that the gospel has made it all the way, or is about to make it all the way to Europe. That's pretty amazing. And it kind of gives us a picture on how it made it here, right? Because it's quite a little trek from Jerusalem to Europe when you don't have cars. Or airplanes. You might could ride a camel or a horse or a donkey or a ship. Anyway, it's made it a pretty good distance. Like this, this thing that Jesus sent out called the gospel is pretty powerful. And it should show us that when Jesus says something, it doesn't matter what you think, if it can happen or might happen or it's pragmatic or feasible. If Jesus says it, it's going to happen. Yes. That's why when people speak words into our life, you can rest assured. If it's Jesus, it will take place. No. You might not see it tomorrow. But if Jesus said it, he'll do it. Amen. And so what's happened is this guy came to Paul in a vision and says, come to Macedonia. Now, again, that's quite the trek. But we're going to pick up reading today 
I think we're going to start it in verse 10 because this today's message is entitled, Not What You'd Expect. The first European church, the church in Philippi, not what you'd expect. I think for us here today, like our gatherings are not what you'd expect. Because if you've ever hung around church life or did church in kind of a corporate setting, this look around the room. It's not what you'd expect, huh? There's multiple ages in here, multiple races, and you know what? We're all family. And that's what the gospel was designed to do, not to separate, but to bring unity and bring people together. But see, when you start and, and using anybody that felt like they could be used. Amen. See, I've served on church staffs that what we did is we had, we had even terminology for it. And this is sad to say this, but there were specialists, ministry specialists. All that meant was that you paid people more, <laughs> a higher salary, because they were a specialist. We called them rock stars. Okay, And people would actually hire these people because they brought something to the table. They, it's called church growth. And it took a while before that kind of started making me puke in my mouth a little bit. Because you had specialists and generalists. And the generalists always got paid less than the specialists. And the specialists were the rock stars. And I was like, there's something not right about this because Jesus used like the strangest people. Like he went out and got a bunch of old scrubby fishermen and said, come with me. I'm going to show you how to do things different. And these weren't like polished specialists. Okay. Their resume didn't look, well, they didn't have a resume, but it was some of the people were hated by society. I don't think that Matthew was a very popular guy with the Jewish community. And he's the one that wrote the letter, wrote the gospel letter to the Jews. I mean, I was, I mean that's wild. But Jesus, his whole mode of doing things is not what you'd expect. He likes to take people like me and you. And, and use us in spite of us. And in spite of our failures and shortcomings. Because when we can do it, we don't need him. But when we fall short, we need him. And that's the power of the gospel in us when you can take a broken piece of clay and change the world with it. And that's Jesus' whole method. So, here's what happens. Paul and Silas started out Paul and Barnabas. But Paul and Silas have decided to answer this Macedonian call. So we're going to start reading, and I wanted you to understand that about the Macedonian call. This guy comes to him in a dream, speaks to Paul, and Paul decides to answer him. That's why we're going to pick up in verse 10. Verse 10, the book of Acts, chapter 16. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to him. Okay. Now this is Luke's writing. Luke's a very detailed person. And he says, after this vision, we sought to go on into Macedonia. Let's go on. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. Yeehaw, pass that word. And the following day to Neapolis. And from there to, what's that word? Philippi. Philippi. Which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia. And a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days. Now watch this. How many of you have ever read the book of Philippians? Okay, some of you guys need to read your Bibles more. <laughs> the book of Philippians is a rather short book. But when you read the book of Philippians... There's some very interesting stuff in this book. Because if you ever noticed that when Paul writes his letters, most of the time he's addressing a theological or a cultural issue. Usually he's telling somebody, you're doing this wrong, you need to be doing this way. Or you're, you need to be doing this or going here. He's usually correcting something. Read the Corinthian letters, read 
Ephesians, he's usually correcting something. If you read the book of Philippians, you'll see that Paul never corrects anything with this church. He's just encouraging to press on to the mark. Keep doing what you're doing, and it's going to be okay. I encourage you to read the book of Philippians because it's completely different. It's an exhortation, not a correction. So it's very interesting when they arrive at Philippi, what's going to happen. Because this is one of the only letters that Paul ever wrote to somebody that he wasn't getting on to them. And they're in Philippi now, which if you look, we know where they were headed from, which was Antioch. And this, this trek alone is over 500 miles. Now, they're not even to where they're getting to. But this is very interesting right here. Next verse. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Now, you got to get a picture of this. Paul's traveling companions, which Luke being one of them by this time, also Silas and a young Timothy. You, you get the details. I just want you to see the group of guys. And they go walking down to a creek bank, and these women are having like a Beth Moore Bible study. That fell flat. Okay. Wow. Wah, wah. Um, okay, they weren't really having a Beth Moore Bible study. They didn't have those back then. But they were having a Bible study, a prayer meeting on a creek bank. Man, y'all wake up, okay? Get, just get with me a little bit because if you're going to picture this, you got to kind of go with me. They were not doing a Beth Moore Bible study. Okay, we're back to they're praying on the side of a creek bank. And we are true on that one, right? Okay, I'm not stretching it. Maybe y'all get woke up and catch some of this little side humor sometime. Uh, next verse. One who heard us. This is very important to hear. One who heard us. Now, to have heard Paul, Timothy, Silas, number one, these women would have had to be awake. Right? If they weren't awake, they didn't hear anybody. And not only were they awake, but they had to be awake in their spirit and open to receiving what God would say to them. Yes. Okay? One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. And we've talked about Lydia quite a bit. Lydia is a pretty astounding woman. From the city of Thyatira. You, know, you need to remember that Thyatira thing. Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Now, I'd really encourage you to get a map and look at this situation. Because what we're about to find out is that Lydia is in Philippi. Follow with me for a second. She's in Philippi, which is about 400 miles from Thyatira. Now, just a guess, but if you owned a home, if you were from a city 400 miles away from where you were, that would probably mean, which we're going to see in the scriptures in a moment, that you probably own a house in both places. Because she's a trader. She, not like a trader that way, but like she trades things. A seller of purple goods. And she owns, she's from Thyatira, 400 miles away. She is in Philippi. She's probably got a little bit of money. And why is that even important? I'm glad you asked. Because you love God, right? Let me ask you a question. Do you have a job? Okay. Most have a job, a house to live in, a car to drive, something like that. Okay, will God... Would God take care of you even if you didn't have those things? Yes. Then why do you have them? It's a very interesting thought pattern because 
It's been something that's been questioned quite a bit. What if it was a test? What if the job, the house, the career, the finances, all that stuff that we hold so dear in our life, what if we really thought about, if I didn't have any of this, God would still take care of me. So why in the world do I have it? And I think God would say, that's a good question. Because what are you doing to glorify my name with what I've given you? Is it about the stuff? Because God can take it away as easy as he can give it. But what if it was about what we do with what we don't need? Because you have to realize that this woman was a successful traitor in the color purple or whatever that means. I don't know, culturally, I don't even know what that means. But you think of somebody like Marie Claire or some kind of, I'm not going to use some of the cultural references I've used in the past, but, you know, like a, a clothing fashionista type person. Like she was culturally hip. Like, she knew what people were wearing. She had the color purple. And a couple of houses. But see, she was a believer in God, so God was going to take care of her either way. Just like he would us. But what are we doing with the things we have, small or large, to glorify God? And I'm not talking about giving to a church. I'm talking about taking an inventory about what we do with our stuff that God's given us. Because he's just given us it to steward anyway. He owns all of it. Now, the the question is, if we think about that in perspective, about what we're doing with what we don't need, it kind of changes the way we think about the Lord. Because he will establish and give you everything you need. Any of us. But this lady doesn't seem to be hung up on the stuff. Because here's the thing. Timothy, young Timothy that's with him, he don't have two houses. He's literally just traveling around with these guys because he's been taken under their wing. And we don't even know what Timothy has. We know he has a praying grandmother. We know he has a praying family. But besides that, we don't know what kind of possessions. Why do we associate everything in our culture with what we can have or achieve? When can we get back to it being not what you'd expect? Because Lydia didn't seem to focus on, hey, I got two houses. Let's, let's just read on so you, we can catch everybody up to speed. Wait, let's go back. Back. Let's finish that one. They're talking and it says she, who she was. She was a worshiper of God. This is very key. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So follow with me for a second. They're sitting on a creek bank watching a Beth Moore video. And Paul just walks up and hits pause. And he says, hey, uh, I want to talk to you about something else. And the Lord opened her heart to what Paul was saying. Now, at this point, she's not thinking about her stuff, her business, anything else she's thinking about. The Lord. Because he had to appeal to this woman. Think about it now. He had to appeal to this woman in a way that she would respond. Because she's a successful business person. And she's not going to just listen to a bunch of mess. Like she has a certain level of intelligence to have a couple of houses and a big business of purple goods. Whatever that is. So... There's some level that the Lord appealed to her 
intellect and it connected with her heart. Amen. And there's some people that that's how the Lord connects with you. See, I, I didn't have a problem getting with the salvation thing. I knew I was dying on bus hell wide open. Like, it wasn't a question just because of my lifestyle that I needed Jesus. That wasn't a question for me. Needed Jesus? Can I get him? Sign me up. But when we got a little deeper into the things of God for me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, stuff like that. Man, I had this block right here in my brain that would not allow the deeper things of God to get in. I don't know if any of y'all struggled like that, but, yeah. but at some level, God was going to have to break past my brain to get to my heart. Yeah. And this is how God appealed to Lydia. The Lord opened her heart to hear what was said by Paul. Let's go to the next verse. And after she was baptized, listen to this. Believer in God, God opens her heart to hear what Paul's saying. And after she was baptized, and what's that next thing say? And her what? Household. Whole household. She urged to say, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed. She won the argument. Because you know how that goes. You know, you meet a stranger and they're like, come to my house. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm not going to go to. A... She won the fight. Okay. Because they weren't just going to go to her house and impose on her. But she won the argument. Because she's a very convincing business lady. And. So she prevailed upon them. That means they went to her house. And I doubt very seriously that they traveled 400 miles to Thyatira and back every day. <laughs> now you see where the second house might have been a possibility. Yeah. It's not like we read that in scripture, but we can actually see you're not going to do a commute of 400 miles when you don't have a car. She prevailed upon us. So let's think about Lydia for a moment. Paul and them get to Philippi on this long journey and the first person they run into is this well-to-do fashionista lady and, they, and God appeals say to her intellect gets to her heart and however he gets to her heart he gets to her heart and she was baptized and her family as well and then she says you guys just stay with me you know what just happened? A church just got planted. It's not what you'd expect, though, is it? You wouldn't think that, you know, you have a little creek bank meeting, maybe a meal, spend a night party, and that's planting a church. But that's how Philippi got planted. Now, let's keep going. And as we were going to the place of prayer, you'll see this, that they were staying at her house, and continually going back to either a place of prayer or back to this creek bank. Because now they have a, a gathering place that doesn't look like what you'd expect. Because we expect, we want a church to look like we would build buildings that you could see from outer space. Not a little creek bank Bible study. But they're going back to this place of prayer. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. <laughs> she followed Paul and us crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, this is crazy. Because now on their way to the prayer meeting, they've got Lydia and her group of women that are meeting at this creek bank, waiting on them to have church. They're on their way, and a little fortune-telling little girl that's demon-possessed is following them around, talking about how godly they are. Watch this. Let's go to the next one. And this she kept doing for many days. 
This is what I love right here. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said, not to the girl, said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So I want you to see something here. You have Lydia that's been appealed to by her intellect or by basically, I guess, smart doctrine of salvation. And then you have this little demon-possessed girl that is chasing them around, talking about they're of God. And Paul gets ticked at her and turns around and casts the demon out. And this little girl has a completely different experience on coming to the Lord than Lydia does. Hers is of deliverance. Like the power of God smacking you down and changing your life. Turns and speaks to the Spirit and it comes out that very hour. And you know what? We've got another person in church. It's not what you'd expect. So as we're growing this church at Philippi, we've got a fashionista, kind of Kim Kardashian type woman. Stop that. And then we have this little demon-possessed girl. I saw that look. Demon-possessed girl that has been delivered that very hour. I had to throw it in there. That very hour, and her life has changed forever, and that is the first two primary people in the church of Philippi. Yeah. Not what you'd expect, is it? But God has appealed to two different people, two completely different ways, so that will mess you up when it comes to evangelism. You can't do evangelism according to a formula. You have to do evangelism by hearing from the Holy Spirit. Because had Paul tried to appeal to this little girl through her intellect, she would have just been following him around every day. Now they're smart men of God. But he turned around and spoke to the demon, to the spirit, and it left her that very hour because he heard not a formula for evangelism, but he was listening to the voice of God that says, if Jesus says it, it'll happen. So in the name of Jesus, come out of her. In that very hour, she was delivered. Now we have two people, and this is probably, I mean, I don't know, my mind works a little wild, but I, I want to think that now the little slave girl is going to go back to Lydia's place. And they're all going to start living together and doing church together. Right? Let's keep reading. Are y'all y'all following along with this, right? Y'all can like see this church being planted? Is it what you'd expect? Okay, I have yet to see a committee. I have yet to see any of that stuff. They haven't even picked out carpet yet. You get that, right? Okay. But when her owners... Whoa. Now, Lydia didn't have owners. Lydia owned stuff. But when this little girl's owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, my God, there's so much in this. When her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. That makes sense, don't it? They done busted up the whole fortune telling business. By speaking to one spirit. <laughs> they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans. Y'all got to follow this for a second because like this is very interesting because what they're saying, Paul has to be giggling about. Because what they realize, don't realize yet is that Paul has dual citizenship. He's both a Jew and a Roman. And he carries this citizenship. And he has to be sitting there going, oh, really? Well, I happen to have one of those cards, too. Not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off and gave them orders to beat them with rods. 
<laughs> that Bible study went south quick. <laughs> because it was okay when you were messing with Lydia and her, her ladies. Because really all she does is make money off the town. But the one that the town makes money off of, when you start messing with her, we've got issues. See, there's so much in that. If a culture can keep you beat down into a place that you can never get ahead, that culture will milk you dry and fight tooth and nail to keep you beat down. Because, think about it, there are people in our community that make money off our community. There are people in our community that our community makes money off of. And it's called socioeconomics. I don't want to get too much into this, but it's very divisive. Even to different sections of town that you see different types of stores and businesses in. <clears throat> this is in people's business. But it's so true because the object is if the city can make money off of us, then they can keep it like that. But if we could ever have the ingenuity like Lydia had, then the wealth of the wicked would be stored up for who? The righteous. This is not a prosperity message at all. This is about perspective and not being used by a culture that doesn't want to release you. And simply not to release you into prosperity, but to release you into all God has for you. They were choking this little girl. She was there at bread and butter. And so when this happened, they're up in a fit about it because Paul and them have not only disrupted the fortune telling market, but they've disrupted all her owner's pocketbooks. Yeah. So they stripped off their clothes and they beat them with rods. Let's go to the next verse. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received his order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. Now, if you think it was going bad when they were getting beat, <clears throat> now they're in prison chained up. And all they're doing is sharing the gospel and commanding spirits to come out of people. But guess what? In the midst of something that's not what you'd expect, God's still at work. And God's still at work right here. Because... Think about it. If we go out to do something evangelistic, like you're going to go pass out some flyers or knock on some doors and share Jesus with somebody, do you ever think that you're going to wind up in jail? Chained to the floor. They did. And here's what happens. Paul and Silas both had this incredible perspective. Because there was a lot more people. Remember Lydia, her girlfriends, Timothy, all these other people that are with them? The Bible only records two people getting arrested. Paul and Silas. And now they've gotten beaten and now they're in prison and their feet are chained up. And all this guy, this jailer is doing is what he's told. He takes them to the inner prison, chains them up to the floor. And let's see what happens. About midnight. I mean, if you get arrested for sharing Jesus, you might as well sing, right? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening. The prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Y'all have heard sermons on this one, right? There's songs written about it and all kinds of cool stuff. But they're singing and praying and this earthquake happens. The foundations of prisons were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains fell off. The bonds were unfastened. Now, that is crazy, right? 
It's a crazy good thing. Because yeah. if you've ever been to jail, and I know none of you have, so we won't get you to raise your hand. <laughs> if you've ever been to jail, how good a news would it have been if the doors were flung open and the chains fallen off? It would have been good news till they caught you again, right? <laughs> then you get another escape charge on top of it. But the, it would have been good news. But these doors fly open, the chains fall off, and it's like, wow, we were praying and singing to God, and this happened. Guess what? God wants us to go. Wouldn't that be what you thought? I mean, the chains are gone. The doors are open. We, we preach about that, talk about that stuff all the time. No more chains on me. And Well, Paul and Silas are sitting in jail, and the chains fall off, and the doors are open, and they have every opportunity to get up and go. Let's look at the next verse. When the jailer woke up, He's one of those jailers like off TV. You know what I'm saying? He was, he was asleep when he was supposed to be working. But when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors were open. I want you to get this picture for a second. You are a prison guard. You wake up after sleeping on the job. Sleeping on the job. You wake up and the doors are all open. Now, according to Roman rule... If you are stewarding a prisoner, the charge on you if they escape is death. This jailer knows this. And he wakes up, he don't even check the inventory. He just sees that the doors are open and he knows this is bad. Because if the doors are open and the chains are off, Guess what? Nobody's home. So he draws his sword and was about to kill himself. Supposing that the prisoners has escaped. Now this is wild because it's what we would all do. Because this tells a lot about this guy's character. This guy does his job to the best of his ability because he's loyal. He does his job and he goes home. He draws his sword not to be killed by somebody else after being tried for letting a prisoner go. He's going to go ahead and handle it for him. Man, I know how this is going to end, so I'm going to go ahead and off myself. And he gets his sword out and he gets ready to do it and he hears a voice. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself. For we're all here. Now, this is huge. Let's see how far we can go. Uh, next one. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what does he say? What must I do to be saved? My Lord. Now, this wrecks me. Because just in this passage of Scripture about the church in Philippi, we can see how God works in ways that we don't expect. He ministers to Lydia in an intellectual, like, smart type of way that appeals and opens her heart. And the next few moments or days or whatever later, they're walking, being harassed by a demonic spirit and a little girl, and they just speak to the spirit that leaves, and this girl's delivered massively by the power of God. And then this jailer, who's just doing his job, comes this close to dying at his own hand and Paul says don't do anything man we're still here and so his first response to them is man how do I get to know who you know (laughs) because this guy and see that's a little bit different than not cussing what they're doing this example that they're showing us a little different than not listening to secular music 
Because I've never walked up to somebody that didn't cuss and said, oh, how can I know you're Jesus? But when I'm about to stick a knife in myself, because I have broken the law, and I find out that you didn't do me wrong, but you were actually waiting to make sure you did me right, I see something in you that's different than everybody else. Because that's somebody that's not concerned about themselves, but concerned for others. And he says, how can I be saved? This is powerful. You know what they showed him? Because Lydia had to be appealed to in a way that would connect with her. Since. The little girl had to be appealed to in a way that would connect with her. She needed deliverance. But this jailer, man, he was a loyal dude that was all about purpose. All about duty. He was appealed to in a way that showed him a greater duty. Yes. Like there's a bigger purpose. There's a bigger mission. There's a bigger everything. And when God does something like he did with this guy, this guy recognizes it and he says, how can I do that? Like, I still want my job as a jailer because I'm not going to have to kill myself now. But I can do it a lot more different now. Because now I've experienced what this Jesus is that you're singing about. It's amazing. And guess what? He says, what must I do to be saved? Now did Paul and them, did they ever get to the point where they said, oh dude, it ain't possible. I mean, you know how many of us you've beaten in this jail? You know how many people you've probably killed in this jail? They didn't say any of that. He says, how, what must I do to be saved? Let's look at the next one. I told y'all there's a lot of scripture. They said, believe, wait, oh, hold up. That should have said do. He said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, what? Believe. Believe. <coughs> Whoa! I mean, they've got it twisted, don't they? He don't want to know what to think. He needs to know what to do. That's not touching anybody's nerves, right? Because what do we want to do as Christians? We want to know what we can do to be better Christians. But Spurgeon said, everything we do is a result of what we believe. Your actions are the fruit of the root called belief. So everything good or bad can be traced back to a root of belief in our life. So here's the thing. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. You and what's that? Man, this chapter is... They, they're, not, they're not set on the simple altar calls. You know where we like come down and we get salvation... And then we just start praying for our family members and stuff. Now these dudes are like, you, you believe Jesus. You believe who he is and watch your whole family come to Jesus. Yes. Yes. I mean, because look, whether it's finances or, or whatever, shouldn't we believe God for the most? Come on. Come on. Like if he's an all, everything, just El Shaddai more than enough God we should believe that, hey man, I don't just have to be saved. My whole family can be saved. Amen. And it's not through my belief, but I can have faith that God can move in their life just like he did in mine. And I can stand firm that he's going to do that. Is it hard? I don't know. I watched it over the last 10 years in my family. And it wasn't like I have some kind of crazy faith. Definitely not like... I've never made any mistakes because I'm, I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But God has done some amazing stuff in my life just because I simply believe Jesus is who he says he is. And there's no doubt if Jesus says something whether he'll do it or not. Is the path painful sometimes? Absolutely. If it wasn't painful, everybody would be doing it. Are there good days and bad days? You just figure that one out because there are some of each. But they spoke the word. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And let's the next verse. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. That's as far as we're going to go. But I want you to just think about that for a minute. Lydia, doing the Bethmore Bible study on the side of a creek bank. And Paul and them come and sit down and break open the word. And Lydia's entire household saved and baptized. And she says, come back to my house. A little demon-possessed girl gets radically saved by the power and hand of God. And now she's part of the family. But the people that were making money off of her decided to buck a little bit and got, get Paul and them jammed up in prison. And God shows up in the middle of a prison not to take the chains off Paul and them. Because we like to preach that angle of it. But the chains and the doors didn't have a whole lot to do with what God was up to. That was just a symptomatic thing he wanted to do. Because if, the, if that was the point, he would have said go. But he didn't say go. He said don't go. Because I'm at work doing something bigger. Because guess what happened? They got out anyway. But instead of getting out via escape, the jailer just walked them out. Now, that's amazing. But not only is that amazing, but now the jailer and his whole family is in church. So Lydia's in church and her family's in church. Little demon-possessed girl, I'm sure they had to rename her because little demon-possessed girl ain't a good name in church. I mean, it might have fit beforehand, but you got to change her name up. But isn't this wild what this group of people look like? Really? I mean, you've got... I want to picture Lydia. I mean, it didn't look like this. I don't know how like these people that did Bible movies would have made it look. But, you know, Lydia had to be put together. She was a business person. Probably a leisure suit. Okay. They're just falling flat. That was a joke. <laughs> no. Um, the, she was, Lydia was kind of put together. Okay. But the little, the little girl, not really put together. Because Lydia owned some stuff. But the little girl was owned. So she didn't have anything even after coming to the Lord because now her trade that had earned her money is no more. The spirit's gone. So she's having to relearn everything. And see, some of us come to Christ like that. Some of us come to Christ in a way that we're like, man, I had it a lot better financially before I knew Jesus. Because now... Now it's just a struggle for me. No, the, that's just a sign that what was earning for you before was not the right thing. And God's trying to reshape everything in our life so that he can reorder it according to his glory. And then 
it's not hard to focus on the right stuff. Like you don't get hung up on what kind of job I'm doing. When you let God do it, God's the focus. His kingdom's the focus. His glory's the focus. So this little girl, I want to think in my world that Lydia gave her a job. Or some of these ladies that met with Lydia. Because the church takes care of their own, right? right. Help her get on her feet. Help her get started. Because she was one of the founding members of the church of Philippi. Yeah. Which was one of the only churches that Paul didn't write a correction letter to. Not what you'd think, huh? Not what you'd expect. But what about this, this jailer guy? I mean, because his whole house saved. Does he ever go back to work? I'm sure he does. Probably goes back to work with a completely different attitude. Wow, just think about a Christian in a Roman jail. If the prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas sing hymns and pray, just think how much mission work a Roman jailer could do that was saved. So what is, I mean, okay, the story sounds good, but like what was God really up to? Because there's always like a, a, a micro picture, what it happened to individuals, and there's a macro picture where everything zooms out a little bit. And we see, wow, <laughs> you, God's smart. Because what was happening here, Lydia had plenty of money. The little girl didn't have any money. The jailer had some money. He was probably middle class. So you have upper, middle, and lower class. You know what God did in this moment, planning this church? He busted socioeconomic issues. Because you can't be, you can't have socioeconomic walls if you have all three classes in your church. That's right? Right? We're not the rich church. We're not the country club church, but we're not the broke church. You understand what I'm saying? We're just the church because the church was never supposed to be built around demographics. If it were, the church in Philippi would have never happened. Socioeconomic. Oh, wow. Lydia was Greek. We don't know what ethnicity the little girl was but the jailer was Roman so there's not only socioeconomic issues there's racial issues and God put everybody in the same group with some Jewish people to say money's not going to be an issue with you race is not going to be an issue with you there's definitely not going to be an issue of prejudice within sexes because two out of the three founding members were women Come on. now I mean I don't know what you do with that but that definitely kind of corresponds with egalitarianism we're not saying that women can't serve in ministry look back at the church of Philippi two out of the three first people in the church were women and the one with the fattest checkbook <laughs> was a woman. So, socioeconomic, money, sex. You know, pretty much what God did with all this is he said, I'm never going to give you a reason to say I work this certain way. Because if you ever think that I work a certain way, then you're going to try to replicate it and construct it yourself, and you'll try to whip it up every Sunday. And I'm not going to build my church like that. And I think that there's a generation, generations, because that's another thing about our church, it's multi-generational. But there are generations that are waking up to realize that we have to come together and be different than what we've become as the church y'all with me yes, sir. okay I know that was very long but look 
I want you to pay attention to this. Because I don't believe that this morning Jesus would have given us, us this to talk about without trying to build something in us. Because see, sometimes we've been looking or we've been told that God moves in this way, He doesn't move this way. That we can actually build up walls and make it very difficult for God to break through. But I want you to know today that it, forget what happened yesterday. Forget what you knew yesterday. Be silent. Let God speak to you today. And if there's something that you need to get with God about, it might be, man, I don't really, I never really understood the gospel, but I want to. If that's you, stand up, come down here. Nothing's going to happen down here. It's not about that. It's about making a bold confession to say, I'm not going to walk out of this building the same as I came in. And some of you might just need to do some business with God and say, man, I'm sorry because I've been making something very big out of something that's not you. And I need to deal with that idolatry in my life right now. Because I just want to believe Jesus. And I don't want to believe that he's the biggest thing in my life. If that's you, stand up and come down here. See, these are, um, these are not things that we should feel bad about. We should all confess these ourselves. Because to tell you the truth, I'm in that camp. There's areas of my life where I make things bigger than I allow God to be. He wants to work in it. He wants to change things. I won't let him. You won't let him. Because see, in that one little last category that I just said, that's all of us. It's, it's difficult though, isn't it? I mean, because it seems like I'm asking you to come pray for something you don't pray about. No, I'm just asking you to know what's in your mind because what you believe will become what you do. So we can all hook up and join hands spiritually. If you're comfortable with this, just grab the person's hand next to you. And we're going to pray together. Because if you're not comfortable, grab the person's hand next to you. If you need to, get up and move, Miss Snow. <laughs> you got a hand. Father, thank you. Thank you for not killing us in our stupidity. And thank you for sending your son, who you allowed to die for our stupidity. Be reborn to redeem us from that. So, Lord, I just pray all throughout this room, realign our focus, realign our mind, our thinking. Let us think on you and how glorious and how powerful you are. And let that flow into every area of our life. We love you so much. You are so faithful. And if there's anyone in here, I just pray you send your Holy Spirit to arrest a heart today for life change. Lord, we step out of this place into your gospel, into your story. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Quick question before we dismiss. Anybody use?